Gang, the coronavirus is sweeping the nation. It's planted its roots. And most scientists are saying it's not going anywhere for a while. Those nasal swab tests are hard to get and they're very expensive. Well, our friends at ProResults are doing rapid COVID-19 antibody testing to let you know if you have had the virus. They take cash or credit, no insurance needed, no doctor appointment required, and you get the results in 15 minutes. Gang, I've taken the test two times. It's painless. It's quick. It's easy. And How Did I Get Here has partnered with ProResults, offering you 15% off COVID-19 antibody testing. Just go to ProResultsAustin.com backslash H-D-I-G-H. That's ProResultsAustin.com backslash H-D-I-G-H for 15% off COVID-19 antibody tests. Go get your tests. Let's get down. You know we all know Spotify as the best and most popular music streaming app. They have millions of songs by millions of artists available at your fingertips. But did you know that aside from millions of songs by millions of artists, Spotify also has thousands of podcasts. All of your favorites are on there, including How Did I Get Here? That's right, gang. How Did I Get Here is available on Spotify along with thousands of your favorite podcasts. They even have original podcasts like Stay Free, The Story of the Clash, narrated by the great Chuck D from Public Enemy. So, gang, get into Spotify, millions of songs, thousands of podcasts. Let's get down. And you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? It's time for How Did I Get Here? Hello, I'm Johnny, I'm your host, welcome to the show, I hope you guys are doing good, I hope you're, I do, you doing alright man, <laughs> you hanging in there, cause this shit is nuts, it's like every time you turn around, some other shit is happening, I'm just waiting for the locusts, if someone tells me tomorrow that there's a swarm of locusts coming from somewhere, I'd be like, yeah, of course there is. Why wouldn't there be locusts at this point? You know? I wonder if that wall that the dude's building would keep out locusts from Mexico. That's a good question, isn't it? Maybe maybe that's his maybe that's the <laughs> maybe he's worried about locusts. Maybe he knows something we don't. You think he knows something? You think you think people know something we don't? You ever get that kind of conspiratorial mindset where you're like, oh man. Somebody out there knows something. Like, they know something I don't know. They're not telling me something. There is that vibe going on. There is, there is that feeling going on. You know? Especially, like, with this, uh, with this secret police people taking over Portland. And now this dude's saying, like, they're going to take over more cities. Are they taking over because it's like a weird thing, like, out of the movie Outbreak? Where they have to quarantine a city and then explode it? With a nuclear bomb. Like, I hope that's not the thing. But my conspiratorial mind does get a racing during this time. Especially, like, I'm, I'm hanging out alone, you know? Speaking of which, I grappled with this last summer as well. And this is, uh, look, man, we've all been going through some shit. We're all locked in our houses. We're all stressed out. Some of us stress eat. Some of us, some, like, so on top of stress eating, I've been sadness eating. My dog died. We had to put him down a few weeks ago. That's not easy. You know how many cookies you try to fill that hole with? Or at least I do. I was trying with cookies. I was trying with uh, with just candy. I was getting chocolate candies for a while, like eating like a whole thing of it. So, uh, you know, it, this is a stressful time. And I took a shower on Monday. And when I came out of the shower, I caught a glimpse of myself in the nude. And I was like, no. No, 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 no. This is not a thing that we need to do. So I got on the scale. It was so bad that I took my towel off because I got on the scale with the towel on. And then I, I took the towel off thinking like, well, maybe that's adding 35 pounds or something. Maybe that's 35 pound towel that I found at, <laughs> at Target. <laughs> no, it wasn't, man. 
It barely moved when I took the towel off. So anyway, so what I've done is is ixnade the cookies. I'm not buying any cookies. I went to the grocery store, shopped only from the perimeter. You know about that? Like don't shop in the middle because that's where the cookies are. <laughs> like just shop on the edges where there's like meat and like uh, vegetables and stuff. So last night I ate just some chicken of chicken breast and some broccoli. I'm eating regular portions. I'm eating salad for lunch. And I've ixnade cookies, crackers, no hummus. Because you know what happens is, like, you sit down and you're stressed out or you're sad or or both. Which, I'm not kidding, is f- fucking the fastest way to, to uh, weight gaining I've ever experienced. Anyway, I, uh, I spent the evening just thinking about cookies afterwards. I realized that over the last few months of eating so many cookies and, like, crackers and shit... I'm just like, there's a point at night where I'm just like, cookie time, cookie time, cookie time. It's like an addict. I start getting like weirded out. It's cookie time. Oh, it's cookie time. So last night I white knuckled it through cookie time. (laughs) Went to sleep. Woke up, had a banana and a hard boiled egg for breakfast. I'm going to have some salad for lunch. It's pretty, (laughs) it's pretty sad because I was making some extravagant meals and I was eating the whole thing, but I make meals for like three people and then I eat them in a night, maybe two of them in a night. You know, or three. Anyway, uh, that that's that's my that's my this week's neurosis. Like checking in with Johnny. How how fucking insane is he this week? This insane, uh, gang. I want to let you know that that next Thursday is my last live stream for a little while. I like to do them in monthly increments. I don't know. Maybe I'll keep it going. Should I keep it going? Come come out. Jo- uh, fi- oh, sorry. It's at facebook.com backslash Johnny Gowdy Music. Come out 6 p.m. Central Standard Time or Daylight Time or whatever the hell it is that they say. Come on out. I sing songs. I hang out. And I talk about my own neurosis. And hopefully I won't look fat on the thing. <laughs> guys, I have a great show for you guys today. Uh, this guy, Greg McGee. I met him at the Sun Radio shows that used to be at Wero's on Wednesdays when people used to go places and do things. I met him there. And uh, he came up, talked to me. I remember we had a good talk. And uh, he told me he wrote this book. And this book is called The Rewrite, a novel. So he gave me this book and uh, told me a little bit about it. And I didn't quite understand what it was about. And I don't know if I can actually explain it. So I'm going to read from the back of the book. Here it goes. Anybody who tells you they have no regrets is a liar or a fool. Honestly, don't you have moments or decisions in your life that you just love to go back and change? Too bad. It's impossible until someone invents a time machine. Well, that's precisely what I'm doing in the rewrite. I'm going back and I'm changing things. I'm going to take myself apart and reassemble him in a parallel universe so that life doesn't suck quite as much as it does in this one. I'm going to get what I deserve. So that's precisely what he does with the rewrite. Greg McGee wrote this book and he, he sort of took this one decision. He made it different than he made it in his real life. And then his whole life changed in this book. And it's a really enjoyable book. It's a very fun read. If you're a fan of like the 70s and the mid 70s and like the people draft, uh, dodging the draft or hating Nixon or Nixon hating them, there's all kinds of crazy shit in this book. Uh, but it's fucking great. It's called The Rewrite. You can find it at the rewrite.rocks. Greg McGee and I have a great conversation about what he did with his real life, a lot of uh, his adventures. It turns out he's a screenwriter, and uh, he's written a bunch of movies. He's worked on a bunch of like film stuff, a lot of movies and TV stuff. And, uh, and then like towards the end, he busts out that he was a Scientologist for a while. So this, <laughs> this is a really great conversation. Greg is a really fantastic dude and a fascinating dude. And this book, The Rewrite, is definitely worth the read. It's a very, very good time. The Rewrite, a novel. Find it at therewrite.rocks. He also has some songs because in his, in his rewrite life, he's a songwriter and a famous protest songwriter. And, uh, and, and he recorded some of the songs that he wrote for the book, if that makes sense. The character in the book, he has recordings of those songs. And you can find them at therewrite.rocks. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with this fascinating man, Greg McGee. Let's get down. How are you doing, man? 
Doing all right. Yeah. Doing all right. What are yeah. you doing during this? What have you been doing? Well, nothing. I mean, I'm. Um, <laughs> What if someone like? Let me ask you a question. Like, are you are you like a well, you shit man? I'm write another book. I mean, are you write, uh, are you gonna write another book? Like, is this the first book of many, or is this like a like? Because this could go either way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, this because you accomplish book, whatever yeah. you were trying to accomplish with a book. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I mean, I've got a couple of other ideas uh, that I that I kind of started on. I haven't quite. Um, um, decided which way I'm going to go. I've got one about a talking dog that I, that I, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to do this guy just wakes up one day and, and his dog, you know, starts talking to him and he, you know, and it just, and it, because the dog is just pissed off at him because he's just fucking up his life. You know? and I, <laughs> I just lost my dog a couple weeks ago. I had for 14 oh, years, but, but there were times when I thought he was about to say something. Oh yeah. I know. I'm not going to exactly. lie. I was usually pretty high, but I knew he was about to say, like, he was about to say, like, like I would say it to him. I'd go, like, just say it. Just say it, man. I know you can yeah. do it. Yeah, I know. Exactly. And that's exactly the feeling that the book is about, you know. And, and so I was taking that. What if it actually happened, you know? And uh, and I was trying to figure out what the, you know, what the story would be, you know, because would it stay private or would it, you know, would it become like, I mean, it wouldn't be much of a story if it stayed private. So, you know, so the way the, the arc of the story was going was that it got out, you know, and then of course they got, you know, <clears throat> they ended up uh, becoming like a worldwide phenomenon. This is actually a real talking dog. It's not a fake talking dog. It's not like special effects. This is a, an actual first dog that has ever talked. Right. Right. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and it becomes a big deal. And, you know, I haven't quite figured that's why I kind of got 50 pages into it. And, uh, and then I, I didn't really know which way to go with it, but anyway, I'm still working. On it. That's one that I'm working about. Did so. you did you did you ever think you were going to write a book ever? I've been writing forever, Johnny. I've been I've uh, I've written uh, probably five screenplays. Uh, won an award in 2018 for uh, best uh, screenplay, you know, for uh, dramatic screenplay for a, a company. Uh, for the uh, Moon Dance Film Festival in New York, it's, did it get uh, just for screen. Did it get made or no? No, no, no. I mean, I I actually wrote some scripts that got made back in you know when I was younger, you know, back in the back in the nineties, you know, in the last century, eighties and nineties. I, I wrote a couple of scripts that were made, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of you know, a lot of it's really difficult to get a, anybody to pay any attention to a film script because there's so many of them out there. So many people writing. Uh, most of it is just horrible too. Just drew. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. So let's talk about this book. Right. What would you like to know? You want me to just start my start a spiel or do you want to start with a question? What's your, how, what, what is your, I'm going to start with a statement, a statement. Okay, good. Okay. And then, and then one weird question, and I'm going to let you do your spiel. Okay. Okay. One statement is, what kind of guy's idea of like a better life is being like hunted by President Nixon? <laughs> like, that's just fucking weird, dude. Like, <laughs> I don't know what kind of life you've had that wasn't the one in this book, but I could say that being hunted by Nixon would be one of the worst things I, I would write a book about a different life if that, if that happened to me but i got away <laughs> you did get away but still that yeah. the, the this like i kept on thinking like that well, when you got to that part i was like who in the world wants the president to know their name in that like in what kind of world is that a better life <laughs> like especially a dude with a list of enemies second of all in your ideal world hendrix yeah. never dies that's right He's playing shows in seventy four. That is exactly right. Yeah, I like I like yeah. that. That was a good. Yeah, yeah. In fact, he died. He. Um, I, I also wrote. Uh, I have a screenplay based on the on the book too, which I'll, we won't get into. But anyway, okay. He actually it, it is revealed in the screenplay. You know that he he he's he doesn't die because of me. You know, I actually 
I make a phone call at a particular time when he's when he's in a you know the the night before he's about to uh, um, OD in London, you know, because this woman he's with is yeah, yeah. is you know just keeping him stoned all the time, and I, and I get a call from him saying, "Hey, Jimmy, you want to put on a track for me? I'm in, I'm uh, I'm with Leon Russell at the Shelter stu- Shelter People Studio in Tulsa. You want to come on over?" And he says, "Fucking hey!" <laughs> so he gets yeah, on yeah. a plane and, and comes and to Tulsa, die. and he doesn't die. Yeah. So anyway, okay, that's that, that's a better scenario than the Nixon one. Yeah. Well, you know, even even though I'm, you know, I'm writing like uh, a perfect, you know, I'll just not say perfect. I'll say a better life than than uh, if I hadn't, you know, the way mine turned out, you know, has turned out. You still need an antagonist, you know, yeah. to make a story. You got to have antagonist you got a protagonist you gotta you know you gotta have stuff in your way or it's or it's just boring you know right. i, I don't want to spoil too much because yeah. you do reveal who the antagonist is in the after word yeah yeah oh you did I, i'm i'm i before well, you didn't actually have time to read it before i'm glad so you read it yeah, yeah but anyway. i'm not gonna have a guy on and then not read his book <laughs> like okay, good, good. I, I haven't gotten there yet <laughs> someday oh, maybe okay. after i've done a thousand <laughs> of these maybe i'll stop reading the books and listening to the records Okay. okay, that's fair. Fair enough. Yeah. Or but if I, I get a team I to figured, read it for you know, me, say what? Or if I got a team to read it for me? Yeah, I just give you the give you the one <laughs> the page synopsis, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, the way I wrote the book, you know, once I, um, you know, once I I got to a certain, you know, and the, the book came out of frustration. In yeah, explain life. that because yeah. you you do okay. you explain that on the back cover. You explain it in the forward. Right. Yeah. I'll just give you a short. You know, I, I was frustrated by okay. Here I'm. You know, sixty nine years old, sixty eight years old, and wandering around. You know, don't have a clue what to do. I, you know, I'm, I don't feel like I've really fulfilled anything in my life. I feel like a basically a, a failure or an also ran. You know, just I'm just not satisfied. And I'm driving around and, you know, and seeing these, you know, I, I drove Uber for like five years, you know, picking up these people in Westlake Hills and these big houses. And, and that really, you know, these people are no smarter than me. They're no more creative than I am. They're usually boring as hell. You know, what did I do wrong? You know, what, how did I miss the boat? So I started, you know, if you do a lot of analysis, you have time when you're driving around the middle of the night. Right. So I started going back and trying to figure out exactly what the points were. Where if I would have taken a different turn, I might have, you know, something else would have happened. Yeah. And I, and that's how I came upon the moment that, you know, drove me down the path again, away from what I really think would have been, well, it's really my best skill, which is music. You know, I'm a, a back, and it was back when I was in high school. I was a, you know, <clears throat> pretty accomplished singer. I was in the choir won all these awards and stuff. And I had this really great bustle voice, you know, for, a, I mean, I was all Adam's apple, right? This skinny little 16 year old kid with a big Adam's apple and big ears. And, and I could, man, I could sing like a motherfucker. I could, you know, I was a really good singer. And, uh, and, but I, um, and I had these guys, you know, these people trying to get me to join their rock and roll bands and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, and I was, I, I, I couldn't do it because my dad was a preacher, Baptist preacher, in a little town called Port of Vaca, Texas. Right. And, uh, man, they, you know, back in the fifties, the Baptist church was like, you know, really, uh, a morals, you know, a moral thing, you know, it was like, no dancing, no right. drinking, no, you know. It's like, you know, like, a, like Footloose. That's the deal. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like that. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was like that. And my dad was, you know, there's only three churches in town, you know, in Port Bucket. He was one of the three. And uh, and uh, the idea of me ever getting into a rock and roll band, would have, that would have just ruined his deal because it was he was up there every Sunday preaching against him. So right. you know, that, was, that but, ain't going to happen. But you got the bug... Uh, from like the classic story <clears throat> of people of your age and generation, mm-hmm. February whatever twelfth. What day was it? February. What are you about? The Beatles on Sullivan. Oh, oh hell yeah! That was the thing, right? That was the thing yeah. that made you want to do this. 
that want, I maybe wanted you want to, to play it. music. Yeah, and I wanted I, I wanted to play music, but I was, you know, of course everybody wanted to play. You know, every guy, you know, every high school boy in the world wanted to be a musician. And when the when the when the Beatles hit, uh, but because I was under the under the you know suppression of 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 the religion, the religious suppression. I just, you know, I knew that I couldn't do it. They made it very clear that, no, this is evil. This is wrong. Right. You can't do it. Just forget about it, you know. So, and so, so in in my little high, uh, high school uh, teenage mind, I associated with music uh, with something that I was, I couldn't do. And the only, and if I wanted to say with music, it would be church music, right? And, um, and I hated church. Oh, man, I was... I think I was, I, I kind of became a, an atheist when I was like eight years old. Right. And I didn't, I didn't even know what it was called, but I just knew that, man, this is, this is bogus. This whole thing they're trying to tell me is ridiculous, you know, and what, it, you know, and, and I'd ask these questions about, well, wait a minute. Okay. Now Jesus died to save our sins on earth. What if, what about all these people on these other planets? Because I was learning about other planets. Right, right. And, saying, and 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 what what's going on out there? Is there do they all have their own Jesuses and stuff? And it's great. Don't you dare touch! <laughs> it's like <laughs> just don't even ask. Yeah, because they yeah. didn't have an answer either. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So uh, so I just grouped in music with uh, church, and uh, and and then when I when I was uh, when I was a senior in high school, like I actually did get a a letter from Baylor University offering me a scholarship, a music scholarship to be in the choir. You know, my, my choir director, uh, John Williams, made it happen for me because he knew that I had some talent. And so they, they wanted me to join the choir, you know, go as a as a music scholarship, full music scholarship to Baylor. And I took one look at Baylor. I'm like, are you kidding? I'm not going to Baylor. That's Baptist, man. That's a bunch of Baptist. And I, oh, hell no, I'm not going to do that. I'll be a choir director on a Baptist church the rest of my life, and I hate it. So I just turned the other way and, and walked away from it. So And where'd you go? Was, um, I went to University of Texas. Okay, well, hold uh, on just yeah. real quick, just to let okay. the people that are listening know, that yeah. is the point in the book. Where you that make it, a, you make a different the, choice, and then you, in the rewrite, write what you wanted your life to be, which includes exactly. a fabulous lady named Linda, right, with magical yeah. boobies of love, right. Uh, <laughs> she's a black belt in karate too. Yeah, don't forget. Yeah, 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 <laughs> karate person. Um. So, so, so you went instead, you went to University of Texas. Yeah. My actual life is that I, well, yeah. Yeah. I went to UT and I got into, I started out, I started out wanting to be, um, um, well, said I wanted to be a marine biologist, which would have been a good career actually in retrospect. But, um, because, you know, it just sounded like something interesting and I would get to go to the beach all the time and, you know, Go out, go out on a boat. I love boats. Yeah, yeah. So I figured that would be the thing. And then I got, then I, uh, I got to organic chemistry and just said, realized, you know, I got, this is not for me. <laughs> and and then my my roommate uh, came in one day and uh, uh, one after one one weekend said, Greg, you got to come help me with my project. Come on, he hit the car. So he so I said, what is it? It's it a big old battery thing about this big and a video camera that's about you know three feet long and a tape recorder about the size of a suitcase portable, you know, so we're, we're going out to, to the park to, to uh, shoot a little documentary, you know, cause he was in the film, he was in the radio television film. And so we, we spent that day, you know, going around talking to people and, and uh, just shooting dogs playing Frisbees in the park. I mean, it was awesome. It was like the best fun I'd ever had in my life. And I said, now wait, this is a, this is a college course. Cause I hadn't, I was such, I was so naive and an idiot, you know, I didn't even know you could study that in college. And uh, he said, yeah, man, radio, television, film. I changed my major the next, you know, I, the next semester, I changed my major to radio, television, film and never looked back. Cause it was like, you know, it was my item because I could, I could be creative, you know? So, anyway. so was, was like David Huff there then? David Huff. 
He's the engineer for ACL. But I know that he was uh, a teacher there too. Because that was all part of it, right? Didn't didn't the yeah, RTF yeah. kids in the seventies at least when when ACL when 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 was when was this you were going to school there? I graduated in seventy five. So the year ACL started. Yeah. So so yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of my best friends. Uh, in fact, I ended up making a uh, writing. Uh, you know, a couple of scripts with her, and almost made a movie with her. Carol Patton Cornsilk. I don't know if you ever heard of her, but she was the director of uh, the. Austin City Limits for yeah, 20 years, I think. Hmm. Uh, she's retired now. She lives in France. Uh, but, um, yeah, she she was a good buddy of mine. So did, anyway, you, did you graduate from? Yeah, UT. With the RTF degree. Mm-hmm. And a dream of doing what? Um, hang on a second. Let me close it. Well, I, I, I worked as, as in the film business for years. I, of course, I wanted to make feature films. You know, that was. What did you do in the like? Did you work on those movies that were filmed here, like Roadie and shit? Uh, I, I was, I was on the crew of Roadie. You, you were know, just like, a, okay. yeah, I was just, a, I was just like a, a grip or something. I got on a couple, a couple that were played here, but, but I, I, I got into the low budget kind of stuff. I, uh, there was a, a guy named. Uh, Jim Orr, oh God, <laughs> and he had this company called the Panda Movie Company, and he thought he was going to it was going to be the. You ever heard of the the, the called the Third Coast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They used to, think, yeah. They used to say Texas was going to be the Third. Coast. Yeah, yeah, in fact, yeah. There was there was a film company in in Austin called the Third Coast. I think there so was anyway, even yeah. like a recording studio here. It shouldn't call that. I think yeah, it yeah, was a studio yeah. and recording studio. Yeah. So anyway, and he thought he was going to redo the whole thing. You know, and so we made two films. And it's, this was in Houston, though, uh, and down in the, down, uh, actually, um, down by the Space Center, Clearwater, Clear Lake, uh, Texas. And uh, so we made a couple of films. And, and, you know, but Jim just could not sell anything. He, he could not make a deal. And it was just such a waste of time. <laughs> we had a lot of fun, though. We made a couple of movies. So anyway, and I so I did a couple, few low budget features, and then I and then I you know ended up getting jobs doing uh, you know sponsored films and and uh, uh, corporate films and things like that, and a lot of commercials and stuff. Okay. So, so that was pretty much. How life. long did you do that? <laughs> oh God, twenty years or so. Yeah. I kind of transitioned when the when the computer about the time that the Mac Plus came along, about the you know the Macintosh came along, I, I started thinking you know maybe I should look at computers. That's interesting because it was I wasn't really interested in, in before that because they were just boring you know just green letters on a black screen and you know just a bunch of gobbledygook. But when it started looking like you could make things move around the screen, I got interested. So anyway, so I transitioned into the into the into the uh, computer biz and learned how to program and learn how to do animations and, and then kind of got into that for a few years, another 15, 15 years or so of doing that. So you didn't get, do, <laughs> you didn't do music at all. I mean, see, that's the deal. I, you know, I always, <laughs> that's why I wrote this book. <laughs> that's why I wrote the book. It's that though, you know, I was so, you know, I was so convinced in my little, teenage head that I could not be a musician that it stuck with me my whole life until I was like 50, you know, and then I started realizing, man, what is, I want to be, I want to, you know, on my 50th birthday, I bought myself a guitar, a really good guitar. Yeah. It looks nice. Uh, you know, a, a, Taylor. a Taylor, a Taylor five, five, 14 C. Uh, and, um, you know, I'd, I'd had, I'd had other guitars and I could never get them to tune right. You know, it's like, yeah, it was just, so I'd try to play and it wouldn't tune. And I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about music. This was before the internet. So you couldn't look this stuff up. I didn't know you could, you know, get a guitar set up and change the intonation and stuff and make it sound good. You know, I didn't know that. I thought it's either a good guitar or it's a bad guitar. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And I had a, and I had a guitar that wouldn't tune, you know? And uh, so I'd always, it always kind of, uh, you know, cut me off of the knees trying to do it. But um, so anyway, at the age of 50, I started really seriously playing and writing songs and stuff. And, uh, and uh, you know, 
at the age of 50, it's already kind of too late to, to break into the business. But, um, but uh, I still got a stack of songs and stuff that I've written. Um, so anyway, it's, it's always been kind of a, kind of one of those things where uh, I think it's a lack of focus, Johnny, you know, I, I mean, I'm not, I can't blame it on anybody else. I mean, I, you know, it's all, it's me, it's my life. And I, it's, I did it to, you know, uh, it's a lack of focus about, you know, actually putting the time and putting the effort into the music instead of putting it into something else. I mean, I've always just had this, uh, you know, I haven't ever had it, it to, to, to make a transition to being a musician. It would take some time to where, how am I going to pay the rent? You know, because I've never made a lot of money, you know, whatever I've done, it's just been enough to just get by. And, and you know, making and, B movies uh, in the seventies in Houston, wasn't paying the bills as much as was, you thought. <laughs> it wasn't. Paying, yeah. It wasn't the old Hollywood living on the Hills kind of thing, you know, where, where I, I thought it was going to be, it was just like, uh, living on uh, sleeping on somebody's couch <laughs> yeah <laughs> trying to run down jim or to give me some money so i could you know buy some groceries <laughs> yeah. in, so anyway in some ways i feel really fortunate because i was able i was lucky do you know who mark hallman is no he's a guy here in town he's a producer he's been around for a, a while since the late 70s early 80s here and he was a friend of my mom's and so from an early age i had a guy it's like yeah. touring with dan fogelberg producing carol king records doing his own oh, band wow. so i had an idea he was very like oh you want to do this and i'm like yeah man i want to meet chicks he's like yeah i mean you meet chicks but check this out <laughs> there's like a fuckload of shit you gotta do you know yeah. like this is not and it's not for everyone and you got to like you're just constantly getting kicked in the nuts is your whole life and you got to yeah. just love picking up a guitar and making music so much that you just don't you as long as you get to do that you're okay with people just kicking you in the nuts all day yeah yeah i you kinda, know, and that's... it takes a certain <laughs> level of idiocy to do it <laughs> right exactly yeah. yeah and i you know i never i never had anybody like that that's, no, that was, no, that's what I, yeah, I noticed I that in your book that like I had I had a dad who was like for completely different reasons. But like I had a dad who was my enemy and that sort of thing. Yeah. And and uh, and sort of like based a life on like trying to uh, get approval from my mentor, which wasn't super hard to do. But also like I'll show my dad. You'll see. I'm going to yeah. be so cool. You won't believe it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You're yeah, going to come to me and be telling people like, yeah, that's my son. You're going to be like, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I don't know if I'll even claim you then. Cause I'll be so cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that yeah, kind of thing. Let me ask you this. There's a, there's a question I do have. Uh, uh, and here, here it is. So this book, I related to it on this level of like, I'm 51 and my mom, not the famous people, but my mom was basically hanging out with you and your friends in that book. Like all those people were having those conversations. The, like I'm of the age, probably the last age that, that understands just from being four and five and six and hearing the Nixon stuff. And hearing the Vietnam stuff. And, oh, did you hear so-and-so had to move to Canada because she was a hippie? And so all of the conversations and the level of, 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 uh, of, uh, of just sheer disgust you had for Nixon, that was something that I totally understood. Then also there's a concert, a triumphant concert at the Astrodome with 65,000 people in attendance. And... Uh, you have all these people play, and I was at a concert at the Astrodome with maybe almost that many people in attendance, or however many people it holds, with almost that kind of lineup. And that was the concert for the hurricane. Yeah, were you there? No. no. Okay. Because I the concert you mean that, that, the yeah, concert in your yeah. book is very similar to it. Yeah, yeah. That well, that's that's probably where I got the idea. You know, because. Uh, 
thank you, Google. You know, you can Wikipedia. I mean, you, there's so much shit you can find out. You know, that was the Rolling Thunder review, right? Yeah, that was that was his. Okay, because yeah. there was also like Santana, Stevie Wonder, Isaac Hayes, Ringo. Yeah, yeah. I think Leon yeah. played. Uh huh. I don't know. Maybe I'm off. I don't know. No, Leon. I think Leon. No, he did. He was on that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but uh, but that's. I mean. Now, what was your question? <laughs> uh, my question was, were you at that show? Oh, no, okay. I wasn't. I think I was, what year was that? Uh, which which hurricane you're, was you're, that? No, no, no. It or? was the concert for uh, Hurricane Carter, the boxer who killed a guy. Oh, Hurricane Carter. That's who the, con- the Dylan was doing a tour, like this all-star tour raising money and awareness for his... Oh wow, that was like seventy five. Seventy five. Oh yeah. wow. I asked my aunt yeah, today. See, that, I was, that was like, there. Yeah, I was I was like just I was in college. Uh I heard about it, but no, I didn't go to okay. it. Yeah. So were yeah. you were you you did you go to the armadillo like you you go to the armadillo in your book? Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, that's where that's where I met uh, Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Oh, let me ask you this: Did you ever? Are you a Turtles fan? Yeah, yeah I love. Did you Turtles. read his book? Uh, uh, why no, my, di- my dinner with Jimi Hendrix or my dinner with Jimmy or something? No, oh, no. His memoir is great. Uh, I'm drawing a blank wow, on his cool. name. Anyway. Uh, all right. So, um, so, so you went to the Armadillo and you went to shows there when you went to college here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Who did you see? Would you did you were you part of the scene at all? Like, did you hang with anyone? I I didn't hang there a lot because I was you know I was too busy work. I mean, I, I was a working stiff man. I had to fucking work all the time. But uh, let me see. Who did I see? I saw uh, Country Joe and the Fish one time. Um, uh, who else did I see? I saw Arlo Guthrie play there. I saw Arlo Guthrie. He's a guy in your book hanging out with you. Yeah, yeah. You remember? You know who Arlo Guthrie is, right? Of course. Yeah, I've met him. Yeah. Okay. You have? Yeah, Lazona oh, Rosa. Cool. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. He's he's a cool guy. Um, who else today? I you know I can't I I was I I, I might have I might have seen you know I think I saw uh, Janis Joplin there one time. I did get to see Janis Joplin at the. Uh, when she played at the Gregory Gymnasium, Gregory Gym on UT campus. Okay. And, uh, oh, wow, what a show. That was amazing. That was just amazing. I was, uh, of course, I was so stoned on purple microdot acid. It was like <laughs> <laughs> the entire top of the, uh, the well, gym you- kind of flew off and I see, saw stars. I mean, I, must, I know you must have been a working <laughs> stiff, but, like, I used to come here as a kid. I think it was yeah. so, like... I mean, not in a bad way. Like my aunt went to school here, and she's my godmother. And I we uh-huh. we I, would, I lived in Mexico in those Nixon times, oh, the Watergate did? era. Okay. But we kept coming back and the Nam thing and everything. Uh, but we came to Austin a lot. We had friends here, and I have very distinct memories of going, like being a little kid, and thinking that the armadillo was super badass because in the back. There was a bunch of other little kids just like me, whose parents were all high watching Jerry Jeff or something. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah, Jerry. I just saw Jerry Jeff there too. Yeah, I did. Yeah, he was there too. But yeah, I I, yeah. I just have a I have a memory of the drag. Then I I remember that I remember going to that Sears, that mm-hmm. Hancock Sears. Oh yeah, and stuff. You know what I mean. So, what yeah. was that like? Like that early seventies, like being on the drag and like, what was that energy it, like? Well, I mean, it you know it was uh, you know hippies. I mean, it was like yeah, wild. It was like remember the movie Wild in the Streets? No. Oh, uh, it was a it was a, a popular movie in the in the seventies, uh, and you know it was. At one point, all the teenagers, you know, and the twenty-somethings uh, decided to take over the the country, and uh, their their motto was that everybody, you know, everybody over thirty has to die. <laughs> it's like, you know, 
if you're over 30, you're worthless. Right, right. You're like, you're just yeah. in the way. It was like, whoa. But um, yeah, there was some radical stuff going on, and 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 all the whole thing with uh, you know the uh, sexual freedoms and uh, and acting up. People are just acting up, you know. That the the, the protests that are going on in the streets now in the last few month or so about the Black Lives Matter. It's, it was like that without masks, of course, and um, uh, not as organized as that either. It's just people just acting up, you know, and they were pissed, just like they are today. Where today at the government, they were pissed off at the government for the war in Vietnam. So that was going on, you know, and just people just angry. You you were pissed in the book, yeah. Like in yeah. the book, you, you, that era, people of your age, and my mom and my aunts and all that shit, they were just. They were pissed. I remember those conversations yeah. with with what, that what kind of level of anger going on while right. I was playing with my toys in a corner or something, you know? Yeah, and it's like, you know, just because somebody pulled a number out of a hat and it happened to have 105 on it, that was my draft number. That was that you actually know? was your draft number? That was my draft and number. And did you dodge and, the uh, draft? Yeah, I did dodge the draft. And it was just because I had a car wreck and knocked all my teeth out. This is in real life, not the book. The book, the book version is is completely different, you know. Uh, what happened? Right. What was the car wreck? I go to Canada. Sure. It was a, it was just a car wreck, you know, and uh, uh, and I and I hit the I hit the dashboard and knocked out all my teeth, and you know, it almost killed me. It should have killed me, really. But um, man, so I had I had this big bridge they had to put in, and and my luckily my the dentist that did all the work was a was a was a uh, uh, pacifist, <laughs> you know. Unlike my dad, my dad would never have given, you know, would never have given me. Uh, right. He, he, yeah. But my this guy was like, oh, you don't want to go to Vietnam? Sure, I'll write you a deferment. Teeth can't, you know, need to be cleaned regularly. You can't get good t- health care when you're in the, you know, in in the, in the trenches jungles. in the war. Yeah. yeah, in the jungles. So yeah, give this guy a deferment. So I got a deferment all the way through the uh, through the Vietnam War for that. Did your because I remember in the book your dad went into the army or into a war of some sort. I don't know if it was World War II or the yeah, Korean War, II. war or whatever. Yeah. But he had a a good gig because he had been a projectionist, right? Right. Yeah. So he never went to combat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's even worse with a, with a guy like that being like, "No, you got to go." You're like, "Dude, you didn't fucking." I'm not going there to show movies to people, bro. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that so, was, and, I mean, that was like a real thing, man. Like that, that, that era of parent and child relationship, the generation gap had grown so big compared to mine. You know what I right. mean? Yeah. A kid yeah, in 67, yeah. a kid in 67 was in a completely different <laughs> situation than a kid in 87 with his parents. Right. Yeah, because the parents were already on the other side with you, you know, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. For a lot of them. My parents were people thing. like you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. That there was that that like whatever happened to these guys in World War II, whatever, even in the movies. Like I remember I remember growing up and being like a teenager and just being like, Why why are World War Two movies like a guy gets shot and he's sitting there and he's like, Ah, oh, Sarge, give me a cigarette, tell my wife I love her, and then he dies. And then, like in a Vietnam movie, this guy's screaming and it's painful. He's bleeding to death. And you're like, why? Why was this one so fun? And like, you know, hey, we're doing something cool. And this one's just like miserable. But it was yeah. the reason that there was no reason to be there. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It was. It was all about selling helicopters. And um, I can't think of any other reason. <laughs> yeah. They just wanted to sell a bunch of helicopters and and. Um, just it was all about business. That's all it was. But what movie? I mean, the the other the, the other thing is that the the Vietnam War movies are probably a little bit more realistic about how horrible it was to die, and and, and they tended to sugarcoat it back in the old movies, you know. And not it's just a different style of making movies. You know? Yeah, I had an but, aunt that was married to this guy that was in Vietnam, and I remember when Platoon came out, and I was like, "Oh, did you see that movie? It's great." He's like, "Dude, that movie, I had to fucking leave." Yeah. Like he's, I had to leave like thirty minutes into that movie. Like that, that was real shit. That wasn't like a John Wayne movie at all. No, <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 yeah. It's pretty intense, man. Did you lose friends at that time to the war? Were there guys you knew? Um, 
I don't know. I never. I did. I didn't lose anybody in the war because I don't know why. It's really. It's interesting that I didn't. Let me ask you this too. Huh. Um, did you uh, like what? What movies were the? What, like what was it that made you want to make movies outside of your friend doing the documentary in Westlake or whatever? Um. Like, what movies are you like, this is my movie? Are you like a Citizen Kane guy, or do you go a little deeper than that? Well, this this may sound a little trivial, but the but the movie I really loved more than any, you know, any one was Jaws. Fuck yeah, dude. I just watched it on 4th of July. Watch it every 4th of July. I know. I just love that movie. And it was... Uh, uh, and I, and I, you know, and I really, I really got into Steven Spielberg. He was my favorite director for, for many years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dude, Duel is, is unbelievable. Yeah. 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 I is. watched that a couple of years ago and was just like, are you fucking dude? This movie is intense, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's done some great, he's done some great work. Yeah. Yeah. I love that whole generation of filmmakers. Like, I'm a big, a huge fan of that. And that they're. Did you ever see this documentary called "Easy Riders and Raging Bulls"? Yeah, I think I think I did. Yeah, it's kind of about that whole group. All those guys were friends and helped each other with their movies, and like you know. Yep. And they were doing. You know, there was. I. I. I mean, I feel like I feel like if the '70s were probably almost like. I would probably had have been more attracted to being a filmmaker than a musician in the seventies, just because it was so strong. Yeah. And the lunatics had taken over the asylum. You know what I mean? It had stopped being <laughs> the big, stupid musicals and shit of the sixties. And like these real movies like French connection and jaws and, you know, the graduate, the graduate. Oh, that was a great movie. Yeah. So, but you, by, by the time jaws came out, you were already out of film school, right? Yeah, yeah, I was so I was what, in I was in Austin, you know, working. You know, I was a working filmmaker in Austin, just doing commercials and whatever I could, you know, whatever I could find, you know, basically. Yeah. <laughs> what did you do on on that movie, Roadie? I need to watch. That. I've never seen that movie. I was I was like a what what they call a lighting grip. Okay. You know, I was one of the guys that puts the lights on the on the stands and runs the cables and plugs them in and stands up there and you know. And, does what the DP tells you about, you know, moving the, you know, the, the, the barn doors around, put a scrim in, you know, and no, nope, double scrim, you know, half scrim. <laughs> just like, so it was just, you know, it's just grunt work, but it was good work. I mean, even, even for that, you can make $150 a day, you know, back then it was fucking good money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude. So if you could get on a film, even today, if you can get on a film shoot, I mean, it's even the guy, wrapping cable is is making a good living you know it's a it's a great uh it's a, it's a great career if you can get into it you know yeah. and uh um as just you know it's just a crew person you know but i wanted to direct of course i mean because that's i wanted to run the show that's where the real fun is man there is nothing more fun ever it, 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 i've never had more fun in my life than to be on location with a film you know, making a movie and as a director and you have like a crew of 50, 60 people, you know, and they're all working on your dream, man. You know, they're, they're, you know, you you wrote, you know, you wrote the script or you had something to do with the script. Usually I was a writer, you know, and you're telling the actors where to go and, you know, and what the, it's your dream, you know, you're creating your dream and you got 50, 60 people helping you to do it, man. It is just, so much fun <laughs> and it's the best time ever yeah man what do you yeah. think of where movies have gone now like what do you think about this whole like like from the superhero thing to like the fucking uh lack of story movies to like now there is more outlets for people but they're just much smaller so you're you you can make a movie on your phone but it might not ever make it to the movies, but you do have an outlet for it. Like, did you see that movie Tangerine? Came Tangerine. out a couple of years ago. Guy shot on his yeah. on his iPhone. Like, super fucking yeah. awesome movie. Yeah, I. It's uh, 
you know, it, it, there's a lot more outlet. There's a lot more outlet for, yeah. for making movies, but it's a lot more difficult to have any career doing it, you know, because everybody is doing it for free. You know, nobody will pay. Nobody will pay you to be, uh, you know, like I, 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 you know, I look for freelance jobs every once in a while. I'm, you know, trying to find some, and, and people, you know, they, they want you to show up with a, with a camera, you know, tripod, set of lights and an assistant work all day long for a hundred dollars. You know, it's like, are you, what, what are you talking about? Well, that's ridiculous. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a and I, that used to be that used to be a thousand dollars. Yeah, and and that's what it's worth because you got to buy the camera, you know, you get any equipment, you got to pay your assistant, you got to have a van, you know, it's you got to, it's a business and it's, and so same it's, it's become you know same, same thing, thing with, with music. the music business. Yeah, yeah same exactly. thing. Yeah, exactly the same yeah, thing. So that's on here. Yeah. I'll have musicians you know, crazy bitching about like, oh man, and I get this Spotify thing and I'm like, man, I, you like Netflix? And they're like, oh yeah, I love it. I'm like, how do you think those fucking guys feel? Yeah, like, right. You go make a fucking movie and get like a fraction of a cent every time wa someone watches it instead of like a right. ticket price at a movie theater or a rental yeah. at Blockbusters. I don't even know how that shit works. I don't even know how people make any money off of anything off of that shit anymore. I, yeah. I don't either. I mean, and that's why I'm, that's why I'm not doing it because I, I have not figured it out. You know, you, you try to get, uh, like, like for, you know, go to Netflix and look at all the, all the cheap movies that are on the net, you know, made by Netflix. Right. And the, and the series, like all the, all the, uh, cop movies and the outer space movies and the, you know, horror movies, all that's all the genre stuff that he just cranking that shit out. I mean, and they they pay they they pay people just chicken feed to make those things. I don't know how they do it. Yeah, uh, you know, and they nickel and dime them to death. Same thing with Amazon, Amazon Studios. Same thing. They're just nickel and diming these people. I mean, a movie, you know, that back ten years ago would be a five million dollar movie. You know, today they'll give you a, a, one million. Maybe, you know, if you're lucky, <laughs> if he, you know, to, to do the same thing. And it's just, there's just, it's crazy. There's, there's a great fucking movie. I bet you'd like it. If you like Spielberg, it has a very big Spielberg, it has a very Spielberg vibe and it's an Amazon movie and it's called The Vast of Night. The Vast of Night. Yeah. Do you have Amazon Prime? Yeah. Check that out. It's a good one. Only an hour and a half. Super great movie. The Vast of Night. Huh? Yes. I highly recommend it to anyone listening. I'll write that down. I just realized you're using a, a nice microphone there. So you got some recording stuff. You got a keyboard there. You got a nice guitar. Did you record the songs that you did for the for the book? I recorded some of them. Um, I did uh, like, uh, I, and, they, and they've all just been me on me and the guitar. I did like the uh, uh, imitation maple syrup blues. Did you? I had that. I had a link to that. Did you get to listen to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did you can, that one. If you're if you're listening to this, I, I mean, I did the the songs are still songs. I mean, you don't have to read the book to hear the songs, but you can go to the rewriterocks.com and there's a Amazon. Yeah, not I an Amazon, a, a SoundCloud guy. On yeah, there. I think I've got three up. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I haven't been able to get get you know recordings good enough to where I liked them yet, so I haven't put any more of them up. But uh, yeah, I wrote all the I wrote all the songs in there. You know, if 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 someone picked up the book, you know, I was hoping that it would get picked up by by a, a publishing company, and then I would be able to afford to go into you know to get a st some studio time or at least hire some musicians and do it right because uh, you know Man, my think, shops are not good enough to do you know to do the whole yeah thing. yeah I yeah. think I've my um. Uh, it's weird because a couple of books like uh, my uh, you know Kathy Valentine uh, yes yeah she yeah, she's put out a book a memoir oh really she did some songs for it too but she I, I, I can't remember the exact story of it but she wrote a, she wrote songs for chapters and it's like an album's worth of stuff and uh, I think she recorded it on her own and kind of had to explain how much cooler it would be to the to the 
publisher, it took them a little while to warm up to that thing, to warm yeah. up to that idea. But to me, it's a fucking brilliant idea. I know. Right? You it got the lyrics like... in the book. Right. Why not go hear this song? Yeah. I don't know how that song goes just by reading the lyrics. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's just a, it's just a matter of um, focus to get them done. <laughs> Uh, to, to get them all done, and some of some of the songs, like uh, the one about my dad, uh, the motorcycle one. Yeah. Oh man, I have tried to get through that one. Every time I, you know, I, I get about halfway through it and I start crying. You know, I can't finish it. Is that real? Did he scoop you up in his hand and put oh, you yeah, in new motorcycles real, and stuff? That's that's a real deal there. Yeah. Yeah. He. That's that's uh, one of my fondest memories. Yeah. He died back in 2006. Uh, we got, you know, we towards the end, we got to be pretty good friends, you know. Uh, but uh, back in the 70s, it was rough. <laughs> well, here's this guy that's life is Jesus and spreading the word of Jesus. And here's this atheist kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. We were just. That you don't even need to add gasoline. That's already burning. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> yeah. it. It's, it's, yeah. it's on fire, man. And on top of that, I don't know, this is a, a whole other podcast. We don't want to get into it now. But uh, back back around 1990, I got, got into the Church of Scientology. This and, is That's uh, not another podcast. We are going with this right now. No, 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 no. Are this, you serious? That, Did I'm you get into anymore. it on the drag? No, no. I, I, I was, at, I was living place? in California. Oh, you I were? was living in California. Yeah, I, I moved to California lived out there for you know 15 years and uh thanks for mentioning that into- in the podcast at the end okay so wait a minute oh. so out there so what did you go into a place and they gave you the test <laughs> oh man I, are you not allowed I, to I talk should, about it come on no, dude i can, I can, up, I can talk about it. I, I wanted to talk about my fucking book man. <laughs> Well, listen, the more interesting people find you, you don't want to give away everything in the book. You're right. Okay. So here's how it happens. You want people to read it. Look, this book is really good. This, this, let me, let me just quickly do this for you. Okay. My friend, Gregory R. McGee. Oh, thank you. Believes that his life turned out to be shitty. It sucks is what you decided. Life sucks when you die. You look in, 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 in high, in looking and examining his life. He saw that there was a choice that he was offered and chose not to take this choice. But then in, in hindsight, at the ripe old age of 68 or 69 or 67, however old you were when you read this book, you, re- you realized you would have had a completely different life had you made this one decision. One now, decision. that life follows him to uh, the top. I mean, the top, the very top. And the also, like, you're top. just living the dream in San Miguel de Allende and, like, uh, right. a place I ran around Beautiful in sun. that era, that same era that you were there in oh, the book. Been there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. My, uh, I don't know if you know, were you there? Yeah. Were you there in that oh. time? Uh, no, no, I was there. I, I just went down there like once to write or know, something 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And then I went down there to write the book and, and, uh, at the end of the last year. You know? Right. I, I read that in the afterward thing, Yeah, but yeah, no, I was there. There was a, a very famous Mexican singer named Pedro Vargas. Yeah. And he yeah. lived in San Miguel de Allende part of the year or whatever. Uh, yeah. he's very old, my grandparents age. And he, he was, he, my, my grandpa and him were best friends. And my grandpa was his doctor, and he even sang Ave Maria at my grandparents' uh, wedding. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so anyway, so we would in our, we lived further south in Mexico, but in our going back from America to the United States, we always went up there and stayed for a week because he was this fucking zillionaire guy with a giant house with a high lie cord in it and shit. But I, when you describe those churches in the book and shit, I remember those. I remember those churches. I remember we were even the there Pinocchio once. Church. <laughs> we, yeah, I don't know if it was the exact Pinocchio church, but yeah, that's a great. Oh, yeah, there's the only one, man. Um, the, the maybe if parroquia, I saw it now, I'd remember. La, La, La Parroquia. It's right on the square, oh, and uh, you have a photo of it in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's you right got on to, the square in San Miguel. You got to yeah. remember when I was there. I was four, five, six, seven. Like I was little. Yeah. I know that they, if they, if you were in San Miguel, your parents took you there. Yeah. Anyway, that's where you always go. That's the one place you go is the city, 
it's the square, the La Parroquia. So you go to the top, you meet the woman of your dreams early on. You guys have a great thing, children. You have a situation where you're fighting with the with the president of the United States. I, be, I become a a, a world famous. Uh, uh, I got you know a world draft famous dodger. Uh, draft dodger protest singer and, and protest singer. singer. Yeah. yeah, that's that's how I make it to the you know through the through the. To the top is that I've become famous as a protest. You come to a level of family, of of family with Leon Russell in the book and Arlo Guthrie, right. Hendrix. Right. You play huge shows. You and your your wife are forever. So yes, and it's and it's a very entertaining story. And there's a whole point where you're running from Nixon, and he's personally coming after you, while Jan Wenner and Cameron Crowe are tracking you through the country, which is also right. amazing, by the way. From the Rolling Stone, yeah. From the Rolling Stone. Um, I have. I, I, I'm. You're right. Thank you for clarifying that because I assume my listeners have always had a subscription to Rolling Stone, like me. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, all right. So you go to California. What did you go to a Scientology place and take the test, and then they started calling you all the time? Okay, here's how it happened. Yeah. I was I was I was in computer bits, right? right? And I was sitting. I was all day long. I was sitting in front of a computer like this, and that's just back when you had the CRT screens, which were like yeah, big electron guns shooting at your face. You know these things. And I, because I was doing pro, I had a big one. It was like a thirty inch monitor. You know, so I was just irradiated with with uh, cathode rays. And and I was starting having neck problems because I was pulling me into the screen, you know. And so I, so I decided to go to a, a chiropractor, you know, to to get to work on it. So I went to a chiropractor. Just I was driving down. Uh, what was it? Uh, Divisadero, I guess it was one of the main streets. Um, and I saw this sign, chiropractors, you know. So I went in there and I and I. Just random choice. Went to this chiropractor and, and started going to this guy, and um, and uh, he was a really good. He was a really good doctor, and he's one of these kind of people that really talk to you. You know, he spent his time, spent time with you. And after seeing him for like, God, it must have been two or three months. You know, I started noticing that he was really different than every anybody else I'd ever met in the way that he listened to you, and and in the way that he, you know, his communication, <clears throat> his communication was so great you know and i asked and i just asked him what what is it <clears throat> what is it that makes you different than everybody else you know i've, I've never met anybody like you and uh, he says well you really want to know <laughs> he says uh i took a communication you know it's, it's called communication course you can take one down at this uh at the dianetics center down here you know if you want to go take one I'll have, here's the address and um I figured, All right, whatever so i did so i went down and uh, signed up for this communication course, and it cost like forty nine dollars or twenty nine dollars. And you have a little workbook, you know, and then you go and you do, and and, and you learn some valuable stuff about communication. Nothing religious. There's nothing, you right, know. Right. So, and that's the end point, you know. Yeah. So they find they find your your ruin, what's ruining your life, and they and they uh, give you tools to work on and to fix it. And so that's what got me into it and they're good tools you know that's they're I, based, yeah yeah they're people you know. that i've heard that from yeah yeah did, did you the, see that yeah. that that alex gimby documentary the alex gimby was that the, the one the hbo uh, one yeah yeah going clear yeah. or whatever <clears throat> yeah 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 sorry and i've ahead. read the book but see none of that when i was when i was going into scientology none of that was out there you know what was year very, was that well that would have been about um yeah, dude, I, I remember, like, being a little kid and, like, watching TV in the afternoon, like, when Gomer Pyle and shit used to come on. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, in the 70s, and they'd be like, Dianetics, yeah. the new book by L. Ron Hubbard, over a million sold. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was not, it was not, um, it didn't have it the It wasn't weird, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it didn't have the connotations it, it, it does now. Dude, I'll tell you what I, I've I've had the whole thing where you, you know, you just think it's weird. And I did go to the. I had a girlfriend, and we were on the drag when it was on the drag, getting yeah. a bagel at the bagel place. She's like, "Oh, I just signed us up for these personality tests next door." 
I'm like, all right, so we go, we do this thing, and then they're like, oh, come here, talk to us. And then I was just like, oh, okay, dude, these people are trying to get us to join a thing. And then, and then I, I always thought they were, because they called me a bunch afterwards and stuff. But about five or six years ago, I was in New York, and I was getting on a plane, and I was listening to a podcast with, uh, where Tom Cruise was the guest. Oh, yeah. And by the oh. end of it, I remember looking at my bandmate and going like, hey, man, you know what? I'm going to look into this Scientology because this guy is really happy and very well adjusted. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like yeah. a neurotic fucking freak. Maybe they do know something. And my friend Kyle was like, dude, <laughs> I don't think it's Scientology that makes him like that. He's also like a very successful actor. So, well, um... there is some kind of actual practicality and approaches psychology more than Jesus-y stuff. Well, let me tell you, uh, do you so you obviously don't know much about Scientology, no. about what it does. Okay. Okay. Um, aside from all of the crazy stuff that, you know, that people uh, attribute to Scientology about, you know, Zenu. learning how to fly and <laughs> Xenu and all that stuff, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh pretty crazy shit and yeah, it's and yeah. that's and that's you know what they call the high the upper levels right they of, give you, you know, when they, when you when you've been in it you know <laughs> when you you're an ot 13 or some crap like right, that right 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 and uh you have an awareness of things that is beyond you know what you're able to see now blah 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 so anyway whatever you know that that that's made I, so I never got that far right but but that you know what what the average Scientologist does is that they that first of all they read a lot they they their vocabulary increases because everything you learn you have to look up every word and you have to learn how to clear the word and that doesn't mean just one definition that means all the definitions all the derivatives and you have to you know, there's a certain technology every word that you don't understand you have to clear it. And until you know it exactly and you can use it in a sentence so you know the word, you know, so when you're speaking, you know what you're saying, you know, or when you're hearing, you don't get, st- you, get you don't get stuck on these words and say, wait, 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 what are you talking about? I didn't get that, you know. So that's the first thing that happens, which is really good. The, 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 but what, what most, you know, the most, um, um, well, the best part of Scientology is when you're actually doing auditing, which is called auditing. Right. And that's, <laughs> and that's when two people are sitting in a room. You got an auditor, which is running the show and the, uh, and the, and the pre-clear, the PC, they call them somebody who is not clear yet, you right. know, who is the receiving person. So, so, but all that happens is that the auditor asks questions to the PC and they're, they're, they're a list of questions that are, it's a, it's a, you know, there's all these processes that you run through to try to make things, you know, improve different parts of your life. So the auditor asks the question, the PC answers. And, and then the auditor is watching, you know, the PC's um, responses, either using a meter that has a little needle that, you know, wiggles right. around uh-huh. or that you can do it without a meter too, just by watching whether or they're, you know, feeling uncomfortable or whatever. Right. You know? Right. And so they keep on asking the same question until the PC gives you all of the answer completely. Right. And, and then they have some kind of a, a cognition, you know, an understanding. And it usually releases, you know, some, uh, some, some pain, some, some pain that you're holding in yourself, you know, and that's really all it is. And, you, and, and so you do that enough, it starts to chip away at all these painful kind of nodules of crap that you're holding in your mind that is, you know, that is taking up space in a lot and, you know, mental capacity that is used to hold on to these nuggets of, you know, encrusted kind of, you know, kind of like a spider would wrap, would wrap, you know, webs around a pain, you know, but same kind of thing. So your mind does the same kind of thing. If something's hurt you in the past, you put scar tissue on it, you bound it up, you know, and then you, so you didn't, so you don't think about it. And so what, so what the, what doing this, you know, what the auditing does, it just goes after all these little things and releases that energy and gives you back 
those areas of your mind so you can use to improve your life and right. to feel better. So really, that's it in a nutshell. But that's not really the stuff you hear about. That is not the stuff you hear about. <laughs> you hear about all the, well, they put him in a room and, you know. Well, there's like the million the year season. contract and like the sea orgs and the. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of. Uh, I know. And it's, and it's. Uh, do you know, and, do you know Scrappy? <laughs> you know Scrappy, I, right? I've heard the name. Okay. You know, because he, he's, he's, he's a good friend of. Uh, For some reason. Plank, I, Plank and Horns, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He yeah. produced Plank and Horns record. He produced my yeah, record, yeah. our last records. Uh, but he, uh, there's a scene in there where Tom Cruise in that Going Clear movie where they have, they have video of Tom Cruise at one of the conventions, one of the Scientology conventions. And he does this thing where he turns to the side and there's a giant uh, painting of L. Ron Hubbard. And he does this thing where he goes, to LRH, and he does this thing. That's how that's how Scrappy says goodbye sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um. But yeah, there's you know there's there's weird there's weird stuff. But there's I mean you know what's funny is is that religion <clears throat> that was thrust upon you is a big theme in this book. You know, this is a right. this is a thing that you grapple with and the reality of it, and then you. You have this whole scene with your dad. Then you have the Pinocchio church scene with your own kid where you're like, how do I explain this thing? And it's actually a really beautiful part of the book where you go into the whole, how would I explain this to him? How do you right. tell this yeah. person this? And I think it even ends with like a little thing of instruction to, you know, yeah, tell your kid the truth. Because I thought it was brilliant, yeah. you know. I had that yeah. kind of upbringing because I I had a mom that was of your safe, like – like I said, like some somebody that could have been one of your friends in the book, you know, right? Her yeah. and all of her friends, like the yeah. groovy people. Uh, yeah, well, that's that's one of the main things that I that I wanted to accomplish in the book is uh, is is to you know give parents people with when they you know not just parents but people that have children just to realize what you're dealing with. You know, you, you can set something in the mind of a child that will, that will, you know, fuck them up for the rest of their life. And you might think that you're doing exactly the right thing, you know, just by telling them, you know, like in my case, you, you know, rock and roll is bad. This is evil. You know, look at that guy with his hips twisting around. That's horrible. You know, and, <laughs> look at all those girls screaming at these guys. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's <laughs> evil. You know, you can't, you know, and that just completely just made my life go in a completely different direction than I, than I wish it would have gone. Um, and, and it's so by, you know, by putting your dogma on your child, you may be damaging him in, in ways that, that will last the rest of their lives. So, so I, I'm just trying to, you know, what I really want, you know, want people to see in the book is that be careful with that. You know, if you're, you know, don't, you know, yeah, you have to give your child direction and, right. you know, you have to give them a moral code. That's important, but don't try to turn them into a Baptist or a Presbyterian or, or a, a Muslim or a Catholic or a Scientologist, you know? Right. I mean, let them make the decision. Just, you know, there, I, this is interesting. There was a, uh, I studied music uh, in one of my courses in uh, at UT was a, my elective was, was, a you know, uh, the music of Hamza al-Din. He was a, he was a tabu player. That kind of, you know, drum. He played with uh, Ravi Shankar and Ravi Shankar's band. And, uh, and he was, uh, he was, uh, from Africa, the country, what is the country? Morocco? Uh, no, Namibia. Namibia. Okay. He, it's a country that is underneath the water behind the Aswan Dam. Okay. It is a country that was completely inundated by the Aswan Dam when they built that dam. Okay. So Hamza al-Din does not have a, that does not have a country. He's a man without a country because it's underwater. But anyway, that culture, the Namibian culture, uh, was a very open culture, you know, and, you know, the, the way they made their, you know, the way they taught their children was, is, you know, you, a child could not decide what religion he, he wanted to be until he knew what all the religions were. So they would, so in the schools, they would say, okay, now we're going to teach you Christianity. Uh, we're going to teach you 
Buddhism. We're going to teach you, you know, Islam and whatever, you know, the, the major, the major religious, you know, things. So these are, these are the main ones out there, you know, and this is what they all mean. This is what, this is the, the tenets of all them. So once you know them all, then you can choose one or don't choose any. It's up to you, but you need to know what they all are. And because they all have similar moral, the moral codes of, of all religions yeah. are very similar. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They're, I mean, you and know, that's, you know, that's the way it should be done. I think. Yeah, the Ten Commandments are a great thing. I just don't know why you have to throw in this thing where there was a burning bush talking to a guy. Like, so you're like, why don't you just tell me what's on the tablets? And I don't care how <laughs> it got there. But those are good ideas, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. what all that hell stuff, like, you know, I mean, at some point, imagine people with no rules living, you know? You just walk up and start fucking some lady at a well. You know what I mean? Yeah, see, that's And just, like, work. you know, kill some dude so you could, you know, it's all just weird. So they had to be like, hey, yeah. listen, it might not happen while you're here, but after you die, yeah, this guy knows all the sh- bad shit you did. Like, you can see how it it made yeah. sense to do. By the way, it's I got to say. It's great, it's great marketing. <laughs> some adult, when I was a kid, had that exact roach clip on your book cover. It's I the kind where that thing, <laughs> that, thing, that thing goes up and makes it tighter. Yeah, 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 yeah right. I know that roach clip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> isn't that funny, man? You uh, so let me ask you this. Ultimately, okay. man, that's what I was thinking. Like your the setup for this book is 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 like I did the wrong thing. I and yes, people do have regrets, and I I understand that. I have my own set, but. Mm-hmm. But you're all right, right? Because I worried about you through the whole thing. I'm like, I don't know this guy very well, but I see him. For some reason, I equate seeing you at Wero's outside in the thing. Right. And yeah. so I'm like, I don't want to, you know, I don't I don't want that guy to be sad. I like you. You're so nice and like, you know, smart. You're fun to talk to. I just had a fucking great time talking to you. I loved your book. I think you have a beautiful imagination. I think that, you know, I mean, I also think that everybody... Honestly, even the coolest dudes get you get to an age and you're like, oh man, I shouldn't have fucked, you know. <laughs> why did I do that? You know, what why did I right, make that exactly. choice at that point? Man, that everything would have been so much different if I would have just, you know, yeah. Become yeah. a vegetarian Except, you know, or something weird like that. An unexamined life is not worth living. That's know? true. That's true. Yeah. But you're feeling all right. You feel good? Yeah, I'm feeling fine. You know, I mean I'm um just trying to figure out what the next step is because I've still got another 20 years to get through and good God, you know, what the hell am I going to do with it? You know? Uh, uh, so that's why I'm, um, that's, you know, that's the thing. It's not really in the book, but you know, the whole, um, uh, problem of, of life and the end of life, you know, when you, when you start getting, when you start, you know, seeing the end of it and it's becomes a more real thing, man, then you start thinking, you know, I should have made better choices <laughs> because I would have had some retirement. Damn. But, but now I'm like, uh, what the hell am I going to do? Uh, so, and, and I'm not alone in that, you know, probably 95% of the people in the United States in, in America are that way. They're just like, they don't have a clue. They don't have enough, you know, social security is not enough to, to live on and everything's going up and you know, you, nobody will hire you because you're too old, you know? So it's, it's, there's a, there's a real social safety net that has gaping holes in it in this country. And, um, and all us old hippies that, uh, that, <laughs> that decided to go the other way and not get that job with a big pension and whatever, you know? Well, we're, I mean, look at all the people that gonna pay the, pay the price. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Look, man, I, I don't, uh, I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Uh, and, and I'm probably in that same boat. I'm just a few years behind you. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, but at the yeah. same time, man, I saw a guy, uh, my Uncle Chuck's dad worked his whole life, played the game the right way, did all the stuff that your dad wanted you to do. But, yeah. you know, like, hey, man, you got to have the job. You got to have the security. And he worked at some place that eventually got bought by a place called Enron. Oh, and God. when he was fucking 82 years old, he lost oh. everything he fucking had from his pension yeah. and everything. 
and had to go work at the hardware store. So to me, it's like, you know what? Fucking live your life, dude. That guy spent 60 years breaking his back for some company that ended up fucking him in the end yeah. when he could have just been living the dream the whole time. So, it, you know, we all end up in the same place. <laughs> exactly. And really the most important thing is to... Yeah. Is to, is to find what it is that makes you happy and do it. Yeah. As, and to me, if, if you. As much as you possibly can. Yeah. If, if, keep on doing it. If your dream w- it was making film or whatever, and you got to make some, you got to be on the set, even if you're a fucking light grip or a fucking sound grip, like, you know, even if I'm in a cover band, I'm still doing the thing that I love to do, making music right, with others. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So ultimately, I think your life was. Or is, sorry. <laughs> that was very weird to say was. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> no, My heart's man. still beating. <laughs> yeah, no, man. I, I, you know, I like you, man. And I, I like what you did with this book. And, I mean, as weird as I thought it was that you, in your fantasy life, you're being chased <laughs> by Nixon. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you gave me a signed copy and everything. I do... Uh, People can get out there and find this book. You can go to the rewriterocks.com. I'll put that link. No, in the it's te- called the rewrite.rocks. R O C K S is the. Uh, oh, shit. The, the rewrite.rocks. Okay. Well, I'll say it right. Yeah. Instead of dot com, it's dot rocks. Okay, dot rocks. Wow. How do you get that? I need that. Johnny Gowdy. It's just one rocks. of those you can get. I don't know. I didn't know you could get it either until, until, I, until I looked for it. Um, but the book is great. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a novel. And there's a gonzo quality to it. You can tell the time that you came up, you know? Yeah, yeah. You're a guy yeah. that's read some Kerouac. That's right. And yep. probably some some Hunter Thompson. Lots of Hunters talked everything he wrote. Yeah. <laughs> it has that, I mean, it's not, it, it's by no means a ripoff of any sort of that, but it has that feeling of that. Yeah. You know, you're on the adventure with the author. It's not, you're not being told something by a narrator. You're with the dude. What do you what do you think about the guy that got dissolved in the in uh, I thought that that was pretty brutal. Yeah. That was very breaking bad of you. Oh man. Yeah. I that I have to attribute that to to Wikipedia because I, I didn't I didn't realize that I didn't know, that realize I didn't know that either. Until I, I just started looking at, you know, okay. Because that's the way I wrote a lot of the book was just like, you know, the timeline. Because I you know, it was like, okay, this is my this is my fantasy life, you know, my my other life. But it still had to happen within the confines of what has happened, you know. I like uh, it though how but, you committed murder, but still, I was you didn't really commit murder, but you didn't. No, you didn't. I just let you didn't commit. stop the death from happening, <laughs> right? Yeah, because he was going to kill everyone. Man, he, was, was, he had a bullet for me. It know? was. It was. It was. It was the the most murder a pacifist can commit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just walking away. <laughs> yeah, just walk away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well dude, I, I yeah, I really enjoyed the book and I I enjoyed uh I've enjoyed our conversation a lot. I always like talking to you. You're a really nice guy. All and, right, man. Uh, we got we got to get together and make some music. Yeah, man. These days. Yeah. And there's music on there too. You got a SoundCloud people can listen to with the song a couple of songs from the record or from the book. Um, you said that you were writing a screenplay real quick before we leave. What uh, what is what are you talking about? Oh, the screenplay on this. It's a screenplay version of this, and and right, yeah, and it's and it's and the screenplay. I I I completely flip it around. It starts out with uh, I'm a new I'm an old Uber driver driving around. Austin, oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, and then and then uh, these people get in the car, and I and I uh, you know, and they. And we're we're singing along to you know, uh, you know, an old country song. And they say, "Man, you got a good voice." And they say, "Yeah, you know." Blah, blah. So, and I we start to talk, and they say, "And they say, are you a musician?" You know, I said, "Yeah, you know." And, they, and so they end end up like we stop at a little park and I play them a song, and they really likes it, you know. And uh, and uh, and then he gives me two tickets to his show, and so I go to the show, and I. Uh, uh, I know I drop them off. I drop them off and then I leave and they leave their phone in the car. He leaves his phone in the car. Shit. So I got to go back and I knock on the door, you know, uh, the Miller, the Miller theater to, to, to hand the guy the phone and they open the door and it says, and it's, and I have become him. So this is, oh. you know, so I get flipped into a, wow. like a other universe. Right. Okay. 
And so they they bring me up on the fucking stage, you know, and I'm suddenly Greg McMahon, you know. Yeah. And I and I'm like at the like the end of his career. And then and you know, and Linda's there, you know, and there and so and then I work my way back from there to the beginning. Yeah. So so it takes the story in reverse, you know, back to back to um, you know, the moment when I made the wrong made the wrong choice. Right. That's pretty awesome. It you is know what very, uh you had bad acne as a kid? Yeah, I did. I was second worst case of acne in the school. Yeah. Does that, in that book, it reminded me of, uh, did you ever read Ham on Rye? The Bukowski book Rye. from when he's a little no. kid? No. Uh, he had it real bad, too. Yeah. But your descriptions of it were, they weren't as brutal as his. Like, he goes into, like, a couple pages of it. Like, yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, like, the uh, most, like, dis- like, it's pretty intense. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. it's it's a horrible thing. Well, um, Greg, dude, this has been great. As I said, people can find the the rewrite at therewrite.rocks. You can get it on Kindle. You can get it through Amazon, get a physical copy. Uh, Thank you for the copy. I read it. I like that you're surprised that I read it. What a weirdo. What kind of guy would have a guy on and not? Well, the first time I called you about, you know. Well, I wouldn't have you on the show if I didn't read it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we went where there were about three, you know, like I remember that when I when I first gave it to you, it was right before the pandemic hit and you were freaking out. You know, I remember I don't know, I sent you an email about it. you said, I don't know whether I should go to the show or not down in San Antonio. Oh, my God. You know, with the, oh, yeah, uh, that was the I, that was the one that got canceled right at the. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they did cancel. it. OK, yeah. I was worried about you, man. I was like, damn, he's freaking, you know, and then uh, and then and then I I went into like just like complete lockdown, my head locked down for like months and then. You know, like everybody. I think said. one of the times you wrote me too, I was in the middle of reading Kathy's and like making notes and stuff, and I was like, I need yeah. a few days off from reading a book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, anyway. but I did enjoy your book a lot, and people can find it at the rewrite.rocks. And uh, thanks right. again, Greg, dude. Great talking to you. Okay, it's been fun. Yeah. So she's out here smoking in the parking lot under the mercury vapor light. Like a vampire on a lonesome moonlit night In a place where no one wants to be That's why the parking's always free In a place where no one wants to be That's why the parking's always free Oh, they think it's supposed to be a plan just sassing for one good man These men are mostly criminals and fools That is why she's got the blue She's got the imitation Maple syrup blue She's got the imitation Maple syrup blue